Hi, my name is Kevin Zachary, and I'd like to welcome you to the first in a series of Bravo Zulu Power Briefs. This first one is titled the PIN Power Brief. PIN stands for Performance Improvement and Neuroscience. In this Power Brief, I will describe how lessons from neuroscience can help improve the performance of individuals and organizations. Uh, to start off, we're going to do an exercise I call the Crossing Arms Exercise. You'll receive more neurological benefits if you participate in this exercise while you're watching this video, but please don't try to participate if it'll place you or others in danger of getting hurt. It's not that big of a deal if you just imagine it in your head. Uh, the first step is to cross your arms when I give the signal. I'll say the words one, two, three, cross your arms, while revealing a slide with a question on it. Your job will be to cross your arms and answer the question out loud as simultaneously as you can. I will give the directions again. When I give the signal, cross your arms and say the answer to the question you see on the slide at the same time that you're crossing your arms. Okay, are you ready? One, two, three. Cross your arms. Take a second to notice what happened. You should have had little or no problem crossing your arms and answering this simple math problem. As a matter of fact, you were probably able to do it without much thought at all. But now we're going to step it up a notch. If your arms are not crossed right now, I'd like you to cross them again and look at which wrist is on top. Actually, say out loud which wrist is on top. Now, cross your arm so that your other wrist is on top. So you're going to change it around. It may take a few seconds to figure it out because you're not used to crossing your arms this way. But don't worry, I'll wait for a second. Make sure you're crossing them correctly too. No hip hop arms. You have to cross your hands just or cross your arms just like the people you see in the slide. The fingers of the arm on top are tucked under the other arm and the fingers of the arm underneath are over your bicep. It feels strange, doesn't it? But that's okay. For the rest of this exercise, this is how I want you to cross your arms with your other wrist on top. Now let's practice it before we go on to the next step. Place your hands on the table, on your lap, or at your sides. Ready? One, two, three. Cross your arms. Now notice how easy or difficult it was to cross your arms this new way as compared to the old way. Double check that you did in fact cross your arms the new way though. Some people think they cross their arms the new way but are surprised to find that they cross them the way they always do. Our brain works that way sometimes. Let's practice one more time since you'll be better prepared for the next step of the exercise. Place your hands on the table on your lap or at your sides. Okay, ready? One, two, three, cross your arms. Take a second to notice what happened this time. Was that easier to do? It, it might have been. The more you do it, the easier it will become. But no matter, because we're going to go to the next step. So place your hands on the table, on your lap, or at your sides. When I give the signal, cross your arms the new way, and at the same time yell out the answer to the question you see on the slide. Are you ready? One, two, three. Cross your arms. How did that work out? Was there a pause between crossing your arms and yelling out your zip code? Some of you probably yelled your zip code and then crossed your arm with a little bit of a delay, but maybe you did it simultaneously and then discovered you crossed your arms the old way, not the new way. And that's okay, because that's, that's what happens sometimes. Now we're going to do the last step of the exercise. So place your hands on the table, on your lap or at your sides, and when I give the signal, cross your arms the new way, and at the same time yell out the answer to the question you see on the slide. Ready? One, two, three. Cross your arms. Notice how different it was this time. You probably noticed an even bigger gap in time between answering the question and crossing your arms, if you were even able to do both properly. Thank you for participating in this exercise. We're done with the crossing your arms. Uh, feel free to cross your arms however you want from now on. But let me explain now what was going on in your brains. This man, Daniel Kahneman, is a psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for his work on decision making. And he very nicely describes the brain as having two separate systems. System 1 and System 2. System 1 is the fast reactive system in our brains and it originates in the limbic system, which, simply put, handles our emotions, our conditioned behaviors, and our memory storage. It was System 1 that was in charge of crossing your arms the very first time in the exercise. System 2 is the slow thinking system and is handled in the neocortex. That's the new part of our brain evolutionary wise and it's the white part where we do most of our thinking. Uh, the neocortex is where our executive functions are processed as well as a source of our consciousness and our personality. When I had you cross your arms the new way this is the part of the brain that had to be engaged. But the conscious part of our brain can handle only so many pieces of information at once. So when it's stressed 
by asking it to answer questions at the same time as asking it to cross your arms in a new way, it gets overburdened. And if the question takes up enough thinking space, System 1 might get involved and take over some of the task, which is why some of you may have found that you cross your arms the old way. So how does this apply to performance improvement? Often, improvement performance requires us to do things a new and different way than we've been doing them before. This requires System 2 to get involved. System 2 is very good at learning new things, but, as we saw in the exercise, or hopefully you experienced in the exercise, when we're under stress, System 1 often gets involved and we find ourselves reverting back to our original conditioned behaviors. That is why a lot of performance improvement initiatives fail. We don't allow the new behaviors to get developed within System 1. To further illustrate this point, let's talk about cash. But I don't mean this kind of cash. I'm talking about this kind of cash. But if you or an organization pays attention to this cash, it will be easier to get more of this kind of cash. So this is the cash box and illustrates how both systems of the brain have to be developed for performance improvement efforts to be effective. The left side of the box, K and S, stands for knowledge and skills. These are knowing what to do and where and when to do it. The right side of the cash box stands for attitudes and habits, or wanting and being willing to do it and then doing it consistently. The left side of the cash box is the learning side, and most people are hired based on what they have learned, their knowledge and skills. If you think about it, a resume is nothing more than a list of what you know how to do and when and where you've done it. Most people are counseled or fired, however, because of their attitudes or habits on the well right side of the box to you, left side to me. Most people are not fired because they don't know how to do their jobs. Most people are fired because their attitudes or habits are not working out with the company. Many organizations don't know that the right side of the cash box even exists. This is why in the United States, approximately 95% of the training and development dollars are spent on increasing knowledge and skills, and only about 5% are spent on improving attitudes and habits. To get a return on their investment, organizations need to pay more attention to the right side of the cash box, because that's where positive behavior change occurs. When the knowledge and skills have reached System 1 as attitudes and habits and new conditioned behaviors, that's when we start doing things in a new improved way. And that's when they're more effective. So what does this mean? It means that we need to train. In other words, train the brain. I used the Alaska Railroad train in that previous slide because I grew up there and worked as a tour guide on it one summer. That's just a side note. Anyway, we have to train the brain using lessons from neuroscience. One element that neuroscience tells us is effective in producing positive behavior change is spaced repetition. As you can see in this figure that I adapted from the Creative Training Techniques Handbook by Bob Pike, a nationally recognized authority on training, if you're exposed to an idea one time, you will retain less than 10% after 30 days. But if you're exposed to an idea at least six times over a period of time, you will retain more than 90% of that information. That's because you're learning the information at a system one level. Here's an example. McDonald's used to have a jingle for the Big Mac that started with two all beef patties. If you remember the rest of it, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles on a sesame seed bun, you're probably in your 40s because that jingle has not been aired since 1976. But it demonstrates the power of spaced repetition. You know, the, the advertising agencies know all about this, and that's why they play commercials over and over, and that's why they try to get catchy jingles. Uh, the second lesson we can learn from neuroscience is the value of experiential learning. The crossing arms exercise is an example of experiential learning. I could have told you about System 1 and 2 in the brain, but by participating in the exercise, you were able to experience the information at a deeper level. You actually experienced it, the two systems were at work in the moment. And this is a key element in producing positive behavior change at the System 1 level. Let me give you an even more ex significant example. Uh, for college, I attended the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. As a freshman there, or a plebe as we were called, we had to do many things that seemed silly and were designed just to mess with us. One of these was the chow call, an announcement we had to make before every meal. It consisted of us plebes taking station at very places in the hallways of the dorm in inspection-ready uniform and yelling a 30-second announcement, well, it depends on how long it took you, but basically a 30 second announcement word for word as loud and fast and clear as we could without stopping. Even when upper class were in our face yelling at us, tugging at our uniforms and trying to mess us up. 
We had to do it at 10 minutes and again at 5 minutes before every formation. Uh, here's an example of the 5 minute chow call. It's been a while. Uh, I did practice a little bit, but here we go. Sir, you now have five minutes to even email formation. Uniform for even meal. Sir, dress blues. Formation goes outside. The officers of the watch are. The officer of the watch is. Commander Konetsky, 6th Battalion Officer. The assistant officer of the watch is. Captain Makuda, 14th Company Officer. Machine officer of the watch is. Machine Lieutenant Commander Trigg, Bre Deputy Brigade Commander. The evening meal is chicken tenderloins with poulet sauce, mashed potatoes, sputtered corn, steamed broccoli, salad wedges, chocolate cake, iced tea, and milk. Sports in the yard are 1600. Navy Rifle versus West Virginia University. Special events in the yard are 2100. Four stall lecture. Time, tight in formation. Wait for no one. You now have five minutes. Sir. As a plebe, we thought these chow calls were a waste of our time, but as upper class, we enjoyed making the plebes do them. It was a tradition, after all. Uh, by the way, this is not a picture of a chow call, but you get the idea. Now, fast forward almost six years. I'm the officer of the deck on a U.S. warship, guided missile cruiser, and I'm responsible for managing a team of sailors on the bridge to maneuver the ship and carry out his duties on behalf of the captain. There are sailors who are steering the ship, handling the engines, tracking other vessels on radar, visually tracking vessels with binoculars, tracking our course on navigation charts, listening to radio messages from other ships and commanders in the area. Uh, it can be a very busy workplace. In this particular instance, we were traveling with this carrier battle group, and for some reason, out in the middle of the ocean, we meet up with this carrier battle group, kind of like it's a city intersection. Oh, and it's 1 a.m. in the morning. Now, one thing you have to understand, this was a very big deal. With this many ships maneuvering past each other in the dark of night, chances are very good for something bad to happen. Something bad enough that, that would end the careers of the captain and officers of the deck of any ships that were involved. This is why I had both the captain and the executive officer on the bridge with me, standing on either side. So put yourself in my place. I have my commanding officer and the second in command giving me recommendations often op opposing recommendations, while still tracking the announcements from the radar operators giving me distance to ships we were supposed to keep station on, listening to the commands that the battle group commanders were giving us over the radio, getting inputs from the navigator to ch keep us on track, receiving recommendations from the combat information center who was also tracking all of the ships in both battle groups and interpreting the radio signals, giving orders to the sailors steering the ship and managing the throttles and listening to them repeat back the orders to make sure they were correct, looking at the steering and speed indicators to make sure they were doing the correct moves, and trying to keep an eye on the few lights of the ships I could see outside so I didn't hit anyone. After about 40 minutes of this, I was drenched in sweat, but the two battle groups were clear of each other, and we were in our assigned station, miles from any other vessel. Captain turned to me and said, hey, good job, Zach. <laughs> I'm going to bed. My executive officer laughed because he could see how bedraggled I was. He clapped me on the shoulder and said, kind of facetiously, that wasn't so bad, was it? Uh, I laughed with him and said, you know what, that felt like the most hellish 40-minute chow call I've ever had. And it was in that moment that I recognized why we had to do those silly chow calls at the academy. They were preparing us for moments just like this. Moments when you have multiple inputs that could overwhelm your system, but you still have to perform flawlessly. Experience on those chow calls, spaced out over the course of a year, gave me the behaviors at a system one level and the knowledge and skills at a system two level that allowed me to shine in a challenging moment at sea in the fleet. And this brings me to the third element from neuroscience that help can make performance improvement more effective and that is using stories. Incorporating storytelling in the developmental process helps us take ownership of what we are learning. Stories, which can take any number of uh, forms, whether they're personal stories, uh, introspective journaling, business narratives, personal mission statements, visualization exercises, affirmations, or even simple discussions and conversations with others. These can all help us connect more deeply with, in with new information and make it easier for us to internalize it at a system one level. Stories help us to learn better because they access both sides of our brains. The analytical, logical left hemisphere that pays attention to the facts and sequence of the story, as well as the real creative relationship-oriented right hemisphere that tries to see the big picture. Researchers have found that our brains are actually wired for stories. When two people communicate, their neural activity almost becomes synchronized. Our neurons are firing in much the same way as the person telling the story, allowing us to experience it in a way. That's why we frequently duck and weave when we're watching James Bond take out adversaries, or why we cringe when we hear the story about how someone caught a bad bounce of a baseball right into the goodie basket. We often learn things about ourselves through stories that we would not have access to learning any other way. Howard Gardner, who's uh, well known for his multiple intelligence um, books, he says stories are the single most powerful tool in a leader's toolkit. So by teaching us about System 1, 
system two in our brains and how to create positive behavior change by incorporating spaced repetition, experiential learning, and storytelling in our developmental processes, neuroscience can help us be more effective in improving our performance. And that, my friends, is the end of the pen power brief. Thank you for watching this uh, power brief and please feel free to share it with others. Bye-bye.